All right, we're going to get started. So again, welcome to Rebels with a Heart. We have an action-packed episode today focusing on the year of the greats, looking at 2022 and before that even. And now as we turn the page coming into 2023, there's so much to talk about today. And we have some amazing rebel leaders here. We're going to do some introductions here. Welcome to each of all of you to the show. Dr. Edie Goldberg, welcome to Rebels with a Heart. I'm so excited to be here, everyone. Thank you for having me. Yeah, please introduce a little bit about yourself, your background. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You tip the tip the the headline here. Now, uh, I'm a uh, talent management organization effectiveness and future work expert and consultant. Uh, I'm a career consultant, which is a little odd and different uh, because I have a PhD in industrial organizational psychology, and I just have always been in a consulting role. In January, very exciting, I become the board chair of the Sherm Foundation. I advise several HR tech companies. Uh, and I'm really, I'm, I'm here because giving back is at my core. And part of that giving back journey is really what led to my interest around the future of work and working with a bunch of HR leaders uh, for about four years, talking about the future of work and how HR needs to change their game so that we can meet the changing uh, needs of employees and the changing nature of work. Well said. Thank you for being here as well. And again, you mentioned this, I mentioned this earlier, this is the 75th anniversary of Sharon coming up this year, and you are the incoming chair of the Sharon Foundation. So welcome and congratulations on that exciting milestone as well. Thank you. So speaking of 75th anniversaries, it's, I understand the 75th anniversary of NASCAR today. John? It is. It yeah. is. Derek, Derek, thank you so much for having me today. And to my fellow panelists, I'm excited to be on this platform with you. Uh, John Ferguson, Chief HR Officer with NASCAR, based here in sunny Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, and we're excited. Today is our Founders Day. We're having a 75th celebration uh, at the Streamline Hotel. What you may or may not know is that the NASCAR's early days were on the hard-packed sands of Daytona Beach. So half of the, the, the loop, you would say, was on the sand, and then the other half was on the road. So we're going back to the Streamline Hotel, where it was all sort of birthed 75 years ago. So we're definitely excited for that. And we're excited for the momentum, uh, momentum that you see in our space. Uh, we were talking about it as we got ready for the call today, uh, fast cars, fast results. Everyone likes to go fast. Uh, and I think we definitely saw that coming out of the pandemic as the ground underneath us in all aspects was shifting uh, and giving us new opportunities that we probably didn't even have on our radar pre-pandemic. Uh, so the, the big question we have today is how do we lean into that? How do we take this moment and capitalize on it? From a personal standpoint, I'm originally from Greenville, South Carolina, uh, born and raised, uh, and I am a proud hashtag girl dad uh, to, to, to my two daughters, Maddie and Olivia, who, little known seeker, are the best uh, people leader coaches in the world. If you want to understand how to manage people, understand how to manage children, because you have to respond to them differently. And that's the same thing you have to do in the workplace. So excited to be here and look forward to the dialogue. Awesome. Thanks, John. We're excited you're here. Welcome again. And coming over to you, Paul. Welcome. Uh, I don't have a 75th anniversary. I was like, as, as you all were talking, I'm trying to think like, do I have any, I have no anniversary today, but I'm happy to be here. You have a big uh, book coming out though. You have a new book coming out. I so have a new can... book coming out March the 8th, 2023. Um, so my name is Paul Wolf. I'm a human first leader advocate. That's my new title. My branding organization has given me um, former HR executive at Indeed, uh, Conde Nats and Match.com. Um, and I spent the last eight years at Indeed until the beginning of this year when I was part of the great reassessment and reevaluation of what I wanted to do. My focus really now is just helping. Um, I'm also a board member at Payscale, a compensation company, and advise uh, several companies in the HR tech space. Um, my new book is called Human Beings First, Practices for Empathetic and Expressive Leadership, March 8th, 2023. Please buy it on Amazon. I, I'd like to recoup some of the money I've invested in it. Um, and it really is around, that's the one thing that makes us the same as we're all human beings first, no matter gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, where we live, where we're from, where, we, where we've grown up. We all need food and water. We all have blood pumping through our veins. And I think leaders, and this isn't a dig on leaders, we've been taught in so many ways to always have an answer and never let them see you sweat. Like you have to know everything. We don't. We really, really, really don't. We're all human beings and we should embrace that and think about everybody in that way first. I saw something online, somebody uses a phrase, employees are human beings first, employees second. 
So it's, an, it's human beings first, and then it's whatever title you have that comes second, because we're all human beings. And so that's my focus in just helping job seekers, helping companies, helping leaders. Um, that's what I'm doing. I'm excited to be here today. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. And again, for everyone here, I'm Derek Lunston, President and Chief Culture Officer of Life Guides, and I'm also the host of Rebels of the Heart series. As a reminder, Life Guides is a platform that connects people who have been through a life experience and better challenge with those who are going through that same experience around themselves or peer-to-peer -peer support, healing, empathy, and mentorship. And so welcome to our guests again, transition to our conversation. Uh, the topic today is around the year of the grace. You know, the, we had a, heard a lot this year about the great resignation. You heard a lot about the great exploration, the great reassessment, the great renegotiation, the great restoration, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of grace that have been talked about in 2022, particularly through the lens of organizations, of talent, of how we make decisions about our career, people reassessing what's important to them personally, as well as professionally, and how that matches up with what we'll call the uh, employee-employer contract and what that looks like going forward. And that's something we're going to talk about is what does the greats of 2022, how is that setting the stage as we transition into 2023 and beyond? And if we even take a step back further, looking back to 2020, how the last couple of years have informed where we are today and where we're going for the next couple of years. And I know each of you has a personal point of view around this, as well as a talent and expertise professional point of view around all of this, I would love to open it up for just an open dialogue um, from your, each of your perspective on how the, the year of the greats has influenced you and how you're planning and shifting into 2023. I'd like to do a setup and then have Paul respond because I think, uh, Paul, what you just said is really key. I think in some respects, calling it the great resignation is you know, it's an outcome statement, but it's not the why statement. And the pandemic, the experiences that we've had uh, over the past several years have really caused this reassessment of people thinking, you know, is this the job that I want to do? Is this an opportunity to upskill myself and be in a more secure uh, position? Um, does my job provide me with purpose and meaning at work? Is this a leadership team that I believe in and stands for the things that have become important to me? We've seen so much social uprising happen in the last couple of years and how companies have stood up have made a big impression on their employees. So I, I do, Paul, uh, we talked about the great reassessment for him. And I, I think that's really what has happened. We've seen hordes of people leave the workforce altogether. Yeah. Uh, whether that be aging baby boomers who just said, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> like that was enough. Thank you very much. Uh, or people who have young children. I cannot Zoom school my children at the same time that I'm working. And guess what? The pandemic taught us that life is fragile and my kids are important. And we figured out how to adapt our work style around that. Um, the amazing people I know who have be become uh, people who just uh, live everywhere, um, traveling the world, having a great time, because if you can work from anywhere, why not explore the world? I love those people who kind of grab life. But Paul, talk a little bit about your experience, because you truly yes. went through that that transition. And I really think we have to think about it as the great reassessment because it sets up for what companies need to do to attract and retain talent in the future. Yeah, I, I, I love the way you, you, you stated it. It's, it's the outcome, the great resignation, great reassessment. It's the outcome. The cause of it for me was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, none of us have lived through anything like that. The last one was a century ago or was a, yeah, more than a century ago now. And it probably was, I, I guess, my first revelation uh, was in May of 2020. So when I was at Indeed at the time, we closed March the 3rd. We sent everybody work from home March the 3rd, thinking it's going to, like everybody else, it was going to be two or three weeks. And then we quickly realized like, oh, like shit, this is not going to be two or three weeks. And I was in, you know, the umpteenth Zoom call of the day. And the, I think there, for me, the way I focused the pandemic is there was crap that we dealt with and we luckily have come through it, not unscathed, not completely unscathed, but we've come through it. We're kind of on the other side of it now, although Dr. Fauci still says it's a pandemic, but we have we have medical, better, you know, better, better uh, uh, vaccines and boosters and other things, no, no more about it. 
Um, and I was watching, just like we are today, all of these things in the background of people Zoom. So when I would come into the office and I'd sit within this pod of HR coordinators and HR business partners that I sat at in our office in New York, I got their work persona. I do think there's a little bit of imposter syndrome going on too. Well, not purposefully, but just, you know, I'm at work, so I'm like this. Versus seeing, I remember it's probably summer of 2020, I met a grandfather. I was doing a multiple skip level with an HR coordinator. She happened to be at her parents' vacation house in the kitchen, and her grandfather walked in the background. She's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, like, let's talk to grandpa. Like, let's like, you know, I would have never met her grandfather had I been sitting in the office. And so that's when the we're all humans like this is it. And you get to see different art. You know, Edie, I can see the books on your background. John, I can see the art on your wall, your wall. Um, and so it's just that's the crystallization. I think the other thing for me and. You, you touch on this a little bit, Edie. Like, I think I love the fact that the pandemic has started to normalize the mental health conversation in the US. I think Europe was far ahead of us. Um, I have OCD and anxiety disorder. I've been diagnosed with it 15, 16 years ago. I have behavioral therapies, meds, you know. The pandemic hit and it started to manifest itself very differently because I wasn't leaving the house. And we started a weekly Q&A like most tech companies did uh, to you know, keep our employees apprised of what was going on, decisions we were making, what was happening. And then probably a, and then an e weekly email, which is kind of like a wrap up from me that went out every Thursday. And so it was probably like the middle of August where my OCD was getting bad. And I was showing up to meetings like I'm supposed to with a smile on my face, but I probably wasn't my normal self that people were used to. So I decided to disclose in my weekly email about what I was going through, not for any reason other than if you happen to be in a meeting with me and I don't seem like myself, this is probably the reason why. This has nothing to do with anything else. I still love my job. I love everybody I work with. I love the mission of Indeed. We help people get jobs. And so it was more of that. And so, and I didn't really think about psychological safety at the time I was doing it. So the internal comms manager sent me my draft on Wednesday, which was our normal, like, you know, process. I tweaked a couple words because she was really good about writing my voice. And I just added the two paragraphs in the Google Doc. And she slacked me and she's like, are you sure you want to send this out to 11,000 people? And I sat there, I'm like, why wouldn't I? Like, what's like, why not? And I'm like, yeah, like, sure. And I pinged the, our CEO's chief of staff. And I'm like, hey, can you read these two paragraphs? Like, I don't want anyone to freak out because I just, you know, I didn't think much about it. And uh, Derek, your comment about um, uh, your organization, Life Guides, about support. I was amazed. I don't. I. I'm sure there were negative comments on Blind, the app, and other places about what I said. But all the hundreds of emails I got back were extraordinarily supportive, and it was other people with OCD and how they were dealing with it, other people with other mental health issues and what they were going through, and just sharing. And I don't think it really hit me until the next day when I was in yet another Zoom meeting. Um, and I was on with our, uh, I was doing a, uh, uh, focus group with some UK based London based employees. And there were about 20 people in the room. And, and the, this uh, one employee, female employee that I knew said, I just want to start by saying, thank you. And I, I can't play poker. So I was like, what, what, what did, it's probably somebody on my team that did something that you're thanking me for. And I want to make sure I pass it on. And she's like, she goes, you don't have any idea, do you? And I said, no. I, I said, what, what, are, what are you thanking me for? And she's like, you made us realize you're just like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it, that That's is to me. And that then the book like crystallized and really in my head, it's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, yeah, I have a fancy title um, and I'm paid differently. And, you know, my travel policy is different potentially depending on the company. But I, like everybody else, get up the same in the morning I have good days and bad days. There's, you know, I'm happy days. There's sad days. There are kind of even keel days, whatever. You know, I made, made the comment we were getting on earlier, like I'm, I'm in New York. I do not like winter in New York. Luckily, there's blue sky and sun today. So it's a good day. When it's gray and dreary, I don't like it. And so I think that like, so if you think about the pandemic and what we've all been through, um, I want to pull through the threads of I can manage my, I, the return to office conversation is really interesting. Like I watch, I, I'm on the other side. Um, you know, John, I, I empathize with you because you're, you're living and breathing it as a sitting CA trail. I like being on the other side of it now because I firmly believe if the company can be successful during the pandemic and have their people work from home, 
I don't know why that can't continue if the employee wants to do that. It's really about flexibility and the employee choice. And I, I talk to people at companies that whose CEOs are saying you have to come in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. There's one specific, I will not mention it, the company. Um, and there's no, Edie, you mentioned this, there's no data behind it. There's no, there's no reason, like good, solid reason, like our revenue is in the, in the toilet and we have to like rally around. Okay. Like I can kind of get my head around that, but I have a friend that works there and he commutes now an hour each way. And he's got two, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old and he misses two hours a day with them. Mm-hmm. And his, his life is was so much better during the pandemic. If you take the medical part of it out because he was with them and you know, these are the formative years you, you, you see first and you coach little league. And, and so it's like, I think there is so much good if in from the pandemic, we can pull through if companies and leaders will understand the paradigm of work that we knew for so long does not exist any longer. That's, I'm going to transition on that. So first off, I want to say a couple of things. Thank you for sharing your story, Paul. I think all of us appreciate just your willingness to share your truth and your experience and your journey as a leader and from your mental health perspective. That's, it sets the tone for this whole conversation. So I want to really acknowledge that. And, and it's encouraging, again, to hear the level of responsiveness from the business community, from your colleagues, from your peers. And again, just as human beings, the level of direct empathy and support and compassion that people had. And that is something that I remain super optimistic about in our culture, that amidst everything that's going on, that is still a core human aspect that we see all the time, that that is there. And that's a core attribute of what makes this time and history so remarkable and so important as we transition. So I also want to come over to you for a second, John, because I want to get your thoughts on this. And Edie, thank you for so selflessly teeing up Paul's story. I'm going to come back to you in a second. John, you were kind of in your first 100 days coming into 2022 at NASCAR, right? You were after you kind of, you finished the year in 2021, you came in. Talk with us about what Paul just shared, how that initial question has applied to you and what you're seeing in this process over the last year and what you're seeing in 2023 as you've been, you know, kind of taking some of the themes of Paul's comments into NASCAR and into your life as well. Mm -hmm. Update your perspective. So I, I want to backtrack just a little bit. When I think about sort of the greats, I, I like the word the great assessment, but I think through all of that, we were grieving. Yes. Um, and when you grieve, you get quiet and you sit still with yourself to determine what's important, what motivates you, um, what parts of your being or your life are not fulfilling to you. So I think that's a word that we don't always necessarily put out there. But yes, Paul, introspection, we get, we reflect. And, and in that moment, you sit still and you realize what's important. But I also have to layer on top of the pandemic, we also had a social justice movement happening here in the United States. Yes. And so you have to look at that intersection and how it impacts individuals possibly differently. Uh, and as HR professionals or people leading in the workspace, the biggest thing I would tell people, because I had a moment of saying, whoa, I can't breathe. I need to secure my oxygen mask first. So I'm expected to show up to a job and and be the support, the go-to for everyone as an HR leader. It was as if the pandemic happened, the social justice movement, and all other business leaders kind of didn't know what to do. They're like deers in headlights. This is nothing different than any other business challenge that we would collectively work through. But at this moment, you know, everyone's like, HR, what do we do? But it was in that moment I realized I had to secure my oxygen mask first. So I tell all people leaders, all HR leaders, have grace for yourself, but secure your oxygen mask first. So when I look at how that plays into my transition, so I guess I was a member of the great resignation. Not all great resignation means that you left the workforce. It could be that you moved on to a different opportunity. Uh, And so there was a lot of movement and I think a lot of growth, particularly when I assess the sports landscape. Um, So joining NASCAR, it, it was definitely for me, I'll talk about my joining the company, because I think it goes to what Paul said. I instantly knew there was one of me and thousands of employees that would be looking to connect. How do I get to know them in this 30, 60, 90 day window? And I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lower the water line on myself out of the gate. And so that's being transparent about who I am, what I do, what I value, my kids' activities. And yes, I need to leave at four o'clock today because we have practice at 530. Whatever that is, because I think when I show up as as, as my authentic self, um, and that's there's, a, there's an asterisk with authentic self, uh, but when I show up being transparent that I'm a human, I'm a human just like you, uh, that allows people to respond to me in the same way. 
But essentially with me sharing so much about myself, it gave when there's thousands of people that I'm trying to connect with, it allowed them to have a connective thread to me. So they could see me and say, hey, you like Big Brother. I saw you, you tell that on the, the garage talk. That's what we call our town halls. So then I had a community around Big Brother or I had a community because they were from D.C., which is where I moved to Florida from. So those are the moments that I think really matter. And you talk about the, the return to work, return to office, the hybrid, the flex, the remote. Oh, that was so my first day. That was the number one question everyone had for me. So what's our policy? I just said, well, I'm trying to figure out where the restroom is. Can, can, we, start, can we start there? Um, and so I, I tell a lot of leaders, let's just embrace the gray. When we think about the return to, to the office, I don't even want to say return to work because that's not accurate. We are working where we are. It's a return to this physical place that is the office. We have to have a great reimagination. Oftentimes what we do and what we promote is what was done to us. Everyone on this call today was programmed that going to the office was how you did work. What we got a quick you sort of gut punch on was that, wait, this could be done a little bit differently. So now the ball is in the, our court to figure out what do we do with this moment, this yeah. hundred year moment, yeah. how do we leverage it? Do we revert to what we know and what we were comfortable with? Or do we... Yeah imagine something new for ourselves, something that drives better business results, something that meets our employees to where, where they are, but something that drives us all collectively forward. So I think those are questions that all leaders need to, to process and think about. And then the other thing I tell a lot of my people leaders, you have to think about how you manage your team differently. It is not about seeing John walk in the office every day. You need to switch that mindset and say, what are, what are the outcomes that John is producing? Whenever they're produced, but what are those outcomes and how can I measure that? But that's a switch that leaders have to do and commit to. So I want to come into this. This is going to be a very rich topic going into how we do this differently. And I know you have a lot of perspective on this, Stevie. Um, but I want to kind of put some foundation again for a second for each of you and for our audience, just a reminder. So Rebels with a Heart, right? The whole concept of how this series started, right? Back in early 2020, this is pre-pandemic is when we started launching and doing all the preparation was exactly the principles that you've all just talked about. It was human first, people first principles in action. If you invest in families, if you invest in leaders, if you lead from the heart, if you lead with humanity, if we lead with vulnerability, empathy, and care, that that was fundamentally a way to change business. And that there were quote unquote conscious leaders and heart, the emerging leaders that embodied that. And that was the that was the vision that we had. And it happened to half start that the very week that we launched this series was the same week that the lockdown happened. So as opposed to highlighting what we thought was a very cutting edge concept, that philosophy, and if we all agree here, is, is kind of a kind of sine qua non, it was the basis for the entire shift of our culture, right? So if you look at the entirety, every leader, this is where it's kind of important to acknowledge to your point, John, because yes, it's a business challenge, but where it's different, where the pandemic has been different two ways. One, every company, every industry, every person is experiencing this in their own way at the exact same time. That has not happened that I know of, and highlighting our interconnectedness in a way that never has really been shown before because of technology and the role that technology has played in this particular pandemic and this shift is changing the way we do, we live, we work, communicate, do business, all these different aspects. And so when you think of the macro level of 2020, individual and business survival, 2021, kind of reestablishing, kind of working through rewriting certain rules, right? Through our shared humanity, our shared wisdom, our shared empathy and stories, stabilizing that. And then 2022, starting to redesign and rewrite. So we're back to the point now where we can truly revolutionize the world of work, the world of life, the interconnectivity of our relationships, how we bring each other together in the container of the workplace, which now has no walls, as we talk about, how we do that differently. We're now at the point where rebels with a heart is re-thrust into it. What do we do and how do we do it? The specifics of how do we work differently? How do we collaborate differently? The policies are no longer what they were because we have to personalize the experience because we all are aware now of the uniqueness of each person's lives. And yet we still have certain kind of fundamentals of business that allow our organizations to grow, to thrive, to, to, to be invested in, to invest in communities. And so how do we reconcile that, right? So I know that's a lot to put out there, but I think it's an important time because this is the great, like we're here three years in the making. Now we're transitioning into a period where we, we think we have an idea of what's going on, 
But we're now going into a macro environment economically that's kind of different, right? The idea of purpose, we have leaders who want to fall back into old patterns, layoffs, cuts, you know, doing these different ways. We have to consider that. How do we shift and consult and lead through this? How do we continue to maintain our ground that we've built around people first principles, but also move and transform the business environment, right? And that's a lot, it's a kind of a multi-part question because it's not a question, it's more of a statement. But I want each of you, because you all have a different lens on this. Edie, you work with so many companies and, and different leadership teams. Paul, you're, you've seen now the inside-outside perspective, you get voice to it, and you're advocating on its behalf. John, you're doing it day in, day out with a brand that's literally transforming itself in the culture actively, right? You all have a different view on this. I'd love to hear your responses and because each of you have brilliance that you've already shared and feel free to take that where you'd like to, but it's really less of a question, more of a, here's a set point. What's the revolution look like from your perspective, right? How do you, how are you doing it personally? How do we do it together? How do we galvanize people, leaders across the, across the world now? How do we maintain and advocate and push forward on the principles that we're talking about and not fall into you know, unconscious patterns, but really be intentional about leading with love, leading with purpose, leading to support and change the macro environment, the, the world of business at large. So anyway. What I love about the examples that uh, Paul and John gave is it really speaks to, I think, where we need our leaders to be today, which is leading with authenticity and empathy. Uh, and you have both, you know, kind of talked about kind of bringing your full self to work, right? And very interestingly, uh, that in 2020, the Sherman Foundation, uh, which is really focused on using HR as a force for positive social change. And one of the things that we really realized was this mental health issue that was that it's not okay yeah. to bring your full self to work, really. And so many people, the, the increase in mental health challenges were astronomical uh, yeah. during this time period. And so one of our pillars is really around making it okay to talk about our, our challenges. And I was blown away at our first uh, Workplace Mental Health and Wellness Summit that one of the biggest ERGs, kind of employee resource group, a support group, um, for, I think it was for Johnson and Johnson became mental health. When they created a mental health ERG, it blew away all the other groups. It's like you had no idea. And there is a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety in our workplaces. And, and we need to have the kind of the compassion and the empathy to help people through that. Cause that's kind of a path to productivity. I recall in, I think it was in 2021, Pat Waters, who was at ServiceNow, oh. um, was giving a webinar and she talked about, uh, they looked at the increase in belonging that happened because your grandfather walked behind you in the video or your cat or your husband or your five-year-old child came on screen. Um, and we all got to know each other in a much more human way. And so there was a huge increase in the belonging scores across organizations. And isn't that one of the silver linings that we need to pull through yes. and continue? Like we learned really good things about treating people right that will, you know, attract and retain them. I, uh, earlier this week, last week, last week, um, I spoke at a Disrupt HR event, and it was on culture is not in your office. So I love all the leaders who say we have to get everybody back to the office because our culture is absolutely falling apart. Your culture is falling apart because managers aren't intentional about how they connect with people. They aren't intentional about how they reinforce the culture that you want. It's all about policies, programs, leader behavior that reinforces culture. And so this is an opportunity. Like, the world has shifted, right? People can get stuff done and not be in the office. Being in the office has to have a purpose because if I'm commuting an hour a day and taking, I'm sorry, an hour each way and taking two hours away from my family, it better not to be to sit on a Zoom meeting all day, right? Being together has to be about connection and collaboration. It cannot be doing individual work. And so crafting our work 
has become more and more an important part of the employee experience. And creating an experience where employees want to be there. They believe in the company. They believe in the mission. They believe in the leaders. They feel seen as a whole human being. Um, you know, we're, we haven't gotten there yet, but there's a huge talent issue out there. And I know a lot of companies are doing layoffs right now, but the talent challenges are not actually going to be solved, I think, by, uh, by some of these layoffs. Um, and so how you show up as a company ends up being super critical right now. I one thing that, that stands, go ahead, Paul. No, go ahead. I think one thing you said there that really resonates with me and what I always tell people, we have to be intentional with everything that we do today. And it goes back to the phrase I used earlier, lowering that water line. What I have recognized is that we'll find way more in common than we don't have in common. And through those connective tissues, we reduce the level of outsiderness. So it goes back to the belonging piece. But when I know more about you, I'm naturally going to give you more grace. So Paul shared his story. You know, maybe maybe my morning commute was met with a, a sick child and had to turn around and go home. Someone threw up, whatever that case may be. But I can come into the office and say, look, I'm 30 minutes late because we had a we had a we had a time getting to the office today, but guess what? I'm not alone. Someone had that just the other day or someone's child, you know, whatever those emergencies are. So I think when we do that and we lead out front in that, we give a green light for our team members to do the same. Yes. Yeah, psychological safety is key. I always think about the messaging that I'm giving to especially my team or the larger staff. And then I say, well, wait, how could that be misinterpreted? And there's been moments where I'll correct myself in the moment and say, wait, 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 I hear what I just said. But I want to let you all know that, like, we are good. We are safe. We have sometimes we're doing certain analysis and reviews as HR. But I was like, wait, I'm asking you to do this task. But how are you processing that? Because at the end of the day, we all are worried about, but what about me? How does this impact me? So as leaders, we need to put that hat on. Another best practice that I think is out there, start your meetings with moments to celebrate. Um, in my PowerPoint, I like to give sort of tactical tips uh, in our department PowerPoint, there's a slide that says celebrate. And I ask for people to start with a phrase that is either I am proud to share or I am excited to share. That helps in a couple ways. You have some introverts who don't really always know how to find their voice in that space, but everyone can say something they're excited about or proud to share. It also helps with them growing their brand, their, their, their work brand, their, their personal brand in those meetings where maybe they didn't feel comfortable. But with that, we're all learning something that they're excited and proud about. And guess what? Now I have an additional connective thread or something that I may chat with you offline about to say, hey, I want to learn more about that. I'm really excited. So those are the ways we have to be intentional. And I don't think it takes a whole lot. Another thing is um, emotional intelligence. As a leader, I come in and I look at my team. I'm like, okay, where's the energy of the room? If I come in, I immediately realize that the energy is low today. I do a one to five post. Hey, one is we all are, you know, go around the room where you're at. One is I'm, I'm ready to get back into bed. Five is I like to say, did you say happy hour? Uh, and so if we're below three, I then as a leader, look at how should I pivot my agenda for today? How should I pivot this presentation so that either I can give them time back or we can be more effective with our time so that people can get back to whatever is pressing on them to get it done. So again, that level of self-awareness, because when you're leading a Zoom call, you can definitely tell when you don't have the room. <laughs> Well said. I, I agree with all of that. I'm going to go back to something John said before he just spoke about leaders. Um, it's not about, and I just put this in the chat, it's not about butts and seats. And there are so many leaders that are so focused on, because of the paradigm we had before, who can I see? And honestly, even if somebody was sitting at their desk, at their computer, they may have been shopping on Amazon. They were just there, like, you know, because that was our paradigm. They have to think about, so I think, I think, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, people to think that I'm crapping on waiters. But I think leaders need to step up. I think companies need to step in and help leaders step up. Leaders need to manage bodies of work, not daily tasks, unless that's the job. And so I'm going to talk about, like, if I think about Indeed, it's a technology company that helps people get jobs. So in those types of, in, in that tech space, like, be good about setting clear goals and objectives and milestones. Check in with your people. You know, psychological safety is important. People need to raise their hand and ask for help and they have to be okay doing that. So as leaders, we can't have every answer because we don't. Like I would honestly, especially during at the early stages of the pandemic, like my peers, 
gone. I think you mentioned this. Everybody's coming to you for an answer. I'm like, if you have a sore throat, I would try and get a virtual chat with your doctor. I am not a medical professional. I do not know. But if I had a sore throat, I'd get on a tele, you know, telehealth visit with my doctor to see if I had could and get a test or whatever the case may be. But that that becomes a thing. And I I also think there's this reliance on there has been this reliance of leaders on HR for so many things. And I think our job is there to help. I always explained my job is me and my team are a group of internal consultants that is going to help this company be as successful as it possibly can be. That's what our job is. Yes, we have hiring targets and we want to make sure that we're you know, telling leaders how not to harass people and how not to bully people and all of those things. EDI, I agree with you. HR fundamentally needs to change almost everything that it has ever done. You know, a, a good example, and I started this when I was in my last few months at Indeed, and I, I'd like to pick it up at some other company at some point, but investigations. I think that word has such a negative connotation. It's a legal word, and we use it freely. Oh, we're going to have to conduct, conduct an investigation. You know, and then I have to interview. It's like, no, like, let's explain what that is. Even psychologically, why don't we change the, like, let's look into this. Like, it, there could be simple things to get people off the Oh my God, I'm I'm on the, the you know I'm on the concerned foot, and then explain what it's going to be like. Explain it to people before they even. Hopefully, they never have to go through anything like that in their career. Explain it to them why we do it, how we do it, and invite feedback. And there's going to be noise in the feedback. Like I'm not a you know I'm a pessimist at heart, um, but yeah, you know, sometimes an employee comes up to you and they're like, Hey, this just happened to me, and I'm okay with it, but I think it could have been done better by X. And it's like, Holy shit! Like that's a really good idea. Because we get so stuck in the way we've done things. And again, you're running up, you know, a million miles an hour as an HR leader, HR business partner, whatever the HR, you know, uh, you know, title you have is, you're running a million miles an hour and you don't always have time to look back and kind of make things better. It should always be this kind of constant evolution. I always used to say, you know, the, the one thing I used to say was, um, you know, one size fits all is now one size breaks all. Yeah. And not, nothing is ever done. Like yeah. when I first became an HR leader 20 something years ago, it was like, it has to be wrapped in this pretty, this program has to be wrapped in this box with this perfect bow for me to push it out to X number of employees. Now it's like, use the agile methodology, use product methodology. Here's the beta. Here's the beta group. Here's how we're going to measure it. Give us feedback and you're going to see it evolve and it's never going to be done. <laughs> and I think that if we as HR leaders and HR influencers and HR advisors, like that's what I'm talking with the head of HR at Payscale about is like, think about it differently. Like if you were starting from ground zero today, how would you do it based on the five generations we have in the workforce today that are very different in some cases and also very similar in a lot of cases. And I think leaders, like we need to help leaders like, and humans in general don't like change where it's uncomfortable. Like I, I, this branding company that I'm working with, I did a photo shoot because I needed an author book, you know, an author um, headshot, a speaker headshot, like all these and a board headshot and like all these other things. And honestly, they put me in some clothes that I was not, I would have never picked off the rack for my, like never. I showed a picture of the photo shoot to my husband because they wouldn't like let me have any of the pictures, but I had one person take one of me. My husband's like, you're wearing color because most of my blue and gray, I've got a little green in my sweater today, but like I didn't go way out there. But like, we don't like change. Like that's who we are as 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 simple beings. Yeah. And so we have to step into the uncomfortable and the unknown and really create the next work paradigm that's right yeah. for the population we have and also our company. And not every company is the same. You know, I will hear a lot of well, Google does this and Facebook does this and Amazon does this. And my response to people, employees, is it like that's great for them. That fits their culture. Like. Let's take this part of that yeah. and leave it into here. But we also have to create a program or a process that fits the culture of the company that we're a part of and the mission that we're a part of. And Edie, I agree with you. Like I hear so many, like that's the one thing when I press CEOs who a lot of times are the ones making the decision to force people back to an office. Well, that's our culture. We have to keep our culture. And like four walls does not make a culture. Yeah. leaders, a mission, values, like goal, clear goals, transparency, um, you know, being our authentic with the asterisk cells, um, you know, that's what makes a culture like four walls does it. And, you know, pay scale is interesting. They were a, an office culture pre pandemic and they've gone virtual first. And I think by the end of this year, all their real estate will be gone. Yeah. And they're going to take that money and use it for 
on sites versus off sites. But I think both of you have said it too. Those have to be intentional as well. If you're going to ask me to travel, even if it's 60 minutes or if it's, you know, five hours on a plane, make it yeah. worth my while. Like the in-person face-to-face is going to be worth it because as humans, we're, we're kind of, you know, those types of creatures. We want to do the in-person. Like I love going back to in-person stuff now. I'm an introvert. So I do my in-person stuff and then I need like a day to like, you know, re-energize myself. So that still needs to happen, but make it for a reason. And there's a there's an outcome and it. I got something out of it, not just because we needed to have our quarterly onsite. And yeah. again, to lead our thinking about things. I agree. So let me throw a let me throw a little twist in here. Like I agree with you fundamentally, Paul. And I'll also say, you know, just saying it's the culture is an easy explanation. What's the what's the underlying aspect of what these people are really saying? There's they either the CEO believes that there's something that's not being optimized in terms of the production or the talent or the communication, or more specifically, coming back to something you said earlier, John, the speed, the speed at which trust is formed, that communication happens, that skills and learning are happening, right? Especially because that's the big, what I hear a lot of times, the top performers are amazing at working asynchronously and remote. It's the people who are lacking in their job skills or their, or their awareness that are really benefiting from that in-person knowledge sharing, wisdom sharing, relationship sharing, so let's just say there's a, a underlying trust gap or a skills gap, right? For example, just take that, not to say there is, let's just say that there was. How would you as talent leaders, how do we as talent leaders address that issue in an asynchronous better as looking like, what if we just acknowledge that less time is better about just being productive as much as it was learning about life skills as well as business skills, as well as job specific skills. And we change the whole expectation around what we're doing at work and how we look at our time, right? Because right now we look through the eight hour lens. If we look at it through the lens of we're investing in education, we're investing in your, you know, notional, your emotional intelligence for the purpose of building trust. We're building different kind of cohorts of where people are in their emotional intelligence or skills journey, right? How does that shift? Because I, And I, I lay that as a groundwork for 2023, as we start rewriting or renewing or reimagining, to your point, what the future look like, how do we bring some of those concepts in? Because I believe that's the fundamental gap of why we're seeing this philosophical dispute about in-office versus remote. I agree with you, but the, I think the big issue there is everyone's approaching it pre-pandemic, like the way they did pre-pandemic. Well, really? And sure. it, you, it's got yeah. it. You flush it down the toilet now. Yeah. The other thing, I, the other thing I've said since the pandemic happened, you, we always, always used to talk about work-life balance, work-life balance. And like, you know, when I was in the in the press, even pre-pandemic, I'd be like, look, the line between work and life is very blurry because of technology, which is a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. You have to manage your boundaries pretty well. To me now, it's just life. And the pandemic taught us, and Edie, you may be coming about silver linings. I refer to them as silver threads because I think there are multiples. Let's pull them through and embed them in the fabric that we, of the culture we're building or the businesses leaders we're building of the future. And it's about, I don't need to do my job between nine and five. If I have, if I'm an early bird and I like to get up at five, like my husband gets up early and since I don't work full time right now, I tend to sleep in. Uh, I also go to bed first before he does. So like, I just sleep longer. Like if I'm an early bird and I'm up at the crack of dawn and I want to plow through four or five hours because it's quiet and I can get stuff done and I don't have Zoom meetings and that's a whole nother issue. Like everything's a meeting. When the pandemic started, everything became a meeting. And I would say to my team, can you just put the questions in a word in a Google doc and send it to me? I will answer the questions. I don't need to be on, I love you. I don't need to be on screen with you for 30 minutes. I could actually, and I also, that's the other thing is because everything was on camera. When do I actually get my job done? Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing. Good. I think we have to think about it. It's life. People One have thing. lives that are all different. Like, again, yes. we're all humans. But our lives are all very different. John's a John's a, a a girl dad. I have three dogs. I've got a husband. Edie's got her family and her 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 bubble. Everybody's got their thing, and it, it's we're going to approach it differently. And we have to. It goes back to helping. I think honestly, it, it, and I I don't mean this in a negative way at all. And I, as I tee that up that way, people are going to take it negatively because I just said that media training one hundred and one. Um, we almost have to deprogram everybody and talk about and re-onboard and reprogram everybody for this new way of work, which I don't think is completely settled yet. I think we have to, so I think for the leaders, the, the easy thing is to go back to what we know, muscle memory. So we have to push a culture of learning and evolving. 
the, yes. the growth mindset, the power of yet. So as, a, as an HR leader, I am very mindful of when I'm having to deliver a no. I always would like to say, let's try it. Hey, can you go back? And maybe I know it's not going to work, but the true lesson is going through the exercise yourself. And then you can validate it for yourself. Like, you know, it didn't work, but hey, at least we got a chance to try it. So let's try it. Let go of the muscle memory, but in, you have to create a, a, a community of always learning, always evolving. And I think that does start in the senior leadership. And if you have a senior leadership team that's kind of stuck in a rut, you then need to be thinking about how can your business continue to evolve? Because if they're not willing to think about something like this differently, how are you going to think about the next business challenge differently? Because we all want to maintain our competitive advantage to be in the forefront and, and leaders in our industry. The other thing that, I, that, I, that comes to mind is when we think about the different industries, not all industries can support remote work. Right. Absolutely. Like, so we, I, I have to be honest with that. And then when I talk to some people, they're like, well, I want hundred percent remote. Well, I say, we're in a, we're a butts and seats and handshake business. There's a track across the street that has 120,000 seats. So that means that someone has to be here. That means that there's things here that someone has to be here to do. But I also believe in helping people find what is most important to them or what fulfills their passion. So if you want that hundred percent remote job, how can we help you get to the tech companies of the world that have those opportunities. So I think some of that is people sit in positions and want it to change to something that it just can't change to be. Right. Instead of growing and seeing what else is out there. Absolutely. I, I think to build on that, you know, I think one of the kind of getting into, so what's the future, right? You know, yes. what happens in 2023. I don't think, you know, we haven't figured out hybrid or remote or what, you know, what that is. But I do believe that the future that we're looking at is some amount of flexibility. And, you know, it may be that I, because of the industry that I work in, my job has to happen on site. But maybe when I'm doing training, I can do that remotely. I mean, maybe there are other ways we could build in flexibility. I think the concept around job crafting is going to start to come about. Yeah. because uh, we just don't have enough talent to execute on what yeah. companies want to do right now. We don't have really. people it's with the right skills um, and, and companies are going to have to get creative in how they leverage that person who wanted to retire or wants to retire and give them the deal that works for them. Or that person who was burnt out, who said, I just, you know, I can't do this, or I don't want to do that. Or the mother who really wants to be there for their kids at a certain point in time. It might be part-time working. It might be job sharing. It's some kind of job crafting that is going to be needed to draw more people uh, into the workforce. I, I agree. And I think it's going to be incumbent on companies. I, I think, Derek, you mentioned this, learning and development, career development, Edie's a career coach, like all of those things. That one thing, one example I'll give you, and there was a luxury at Indeed. We were an HR tech company and we were doing very well. So we did not let anybody go during the pandemic. Thank God. Um, we also had, because we all used Indeed to recruit, a team of 375 recruiters that were part of my organization. And so the pandemic hit. And we went on a hiring freeze and I had 375 bodies and they were all like, we're going to get laid off. And we had made a verbal, like me, CEO, COO, verbal commitments about, no, and that's not the level we're going to pull. And the one thing we did was basically we took those 375 people and said, here are where we need help. Here are project backlogs. Here's customer yeah. client success issues. Here are even sales, like, you know, um, you know finding sales leads for our sales, uh, uh, you know, our, our sales folks, anything that we needed help in other parts of HR. And we said, here are, you can pick from these five functions and this is the type of job. And those 375 people went off and did that. A vast majority of them, when we picked up hiring again, a couple months later, came back. But we had a lot of them just move to other parts of the organization because they found Edie to your point. I liked the job I did. I was been doing it a long time. I was burnt out or I really didn't like it. But now I found my company afforded me and we were again, forced to. So I think companies have to think about this and it's not 
logistically simple <laughs> to do. And, and, you know, not every company is financially healthy. That's why you see a lot of the layoffs today is it's just like finances. And then you question, well, what did it, what decisions did you make that led you to this point? I think the Stripe uh, layoff, the CEO and president, I believe the email they sent around was a good way of them being transparent. It's a good example that I use. There are other companies I will not mention that I think have done them horribly. Um, you know, I'll leave it at that. I get in trouble when I mention companies that do bad things. Um, but I, I just so like, I, I love it. And I, then you think about, okay, skills-based jobs, skills-based pay. Um, and then you get into that, you start to, the epiphany, the, like the, 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 the most utopian part of it becomes, I am doing this job that was crafted, that I crafted for myself, that this company needs these things done. And I believe in the mission, the values, and the leaders. Like that's kind of again, but I love it. And I'm not going to go anywhere. And I think companies have to start to think about that. They have these resources today. They're not going to be there forever. I've always said, it's not, you know, my mom taught school for 32 years in Florida. Um, my father-in-law worked at Ford for 40 years. That doesn't exist any longer. And so how long, how, how can I stretch how long I have them? And how can I make that experience for them as great as possible so that when they're on the other side of my company, they still talk positively about the time there. Paul, you set me up, so I can't <laughs> go for it. You, go for exactly. it. you set me up to start this conversation. Look over my shoulder. There's a book here called The Inside. <laughs> so uh, this was kind of interesting because I wrote the book, and the book was published April of 2020, a really terrible time to publish a book, right? Sold really great in the bookstores, and then all the bookstores closed. But um, the concept is around moving talent around. Uh, internal talent mobility and how that really unleashes the talent that you have inside. And what interestingly happened during the pandemic is companies had to do, Paul, exactly what you said. You know, I have stories of, you know, Bank of America, you know, if you want to work in the loan department, you have to have loan experience. And then what happened during the pandemic? We They created a PPP loan department, right? You know, all of a sudden this new type of loan came about and they had to staff a whole big department out of thin air and all their branches were shut down. Right. You know, so how do you pivot your people yep. to your most bu important business priorities? And, and I think what we're learning is companies need to be more agile. Yes. yes. And so we need to know our talent better. Yes. And we need to have strategies to be able to move them to our most pressing business priorities. That's what the inside data is really all about. And, so and I, leaders, uh, leaders need to be digging in with those folks about what they want to do, what makes yeah. them happy. like, I, 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 it's not, and I think HR needs to build programs, but I, it's so, and I don't, again, don't want to pick on leaders. And I think we need to support them in the right way, but their job has fundamentally changed. Right. And I also think employees need to know how to advocate for themselves. Yes. Uh, one of my so life models is close, closed yeah, mouths right. don't get fed. Uh, so many times people will come to me, well, I didn't get XYZ promotion. Well, did you raise your hand? Did you, did you let people know that like, I want growth? You know, I, I see myself growing here. These are the things that excite me. When we have those moments of small talk, are you talking about what I'm proud to share, what I'm excited to share? Because you're building your brand and showing your excitement for other areas of the business. So I think we have to teach people how they are the drivers of their professional development. So often we give that and all of that power away to our manager or all of that power away to the NASCAR University uh, learning development platform. No, you are responsible for that. Everyone should be going to their manager and say, hey, I'm excited for the next year. This is how I look to grow personally and professionally. And then if there's an investment that you're seeking from the company, put that out there so people can review it and figure out if that's something they can support. The one thing I want to ask that, John, is if your manager is not listening or doesn't care, go talk to somebody else. It that's doesn't, it, it, the ideal is your manager and they care and they listen. And it's like, okay, let's build a plan. But there are still some that just don't, they're, they're, I, I'm the manager, I control this. Like there's still that group, like go, like ask somebody else, talk to your HR business partner, find a mentor, like just grow and develop. Yes. Sometimes you have to get scrappy with that. And that yes. means having conversations with different people yep. to try to work towards the outcome that you want. Another secret tool I'm going to tell you that has popped up on the scene. Let's talk about the power of TikTok. Oh. It is a wealth of information for leaders, for employees. Anytime I have something new that I want to do, I am checking out TikTok. What are people saying? What are the perspectives, whether it's generational differences, whether it's cultural differences, 
or just like, what are some best practices that are out here? So I encourage everyone to get on TikTok because maybe you want to go in and have a negotiation about your current salary. Someone's going to tell you a play by play on how to do that. Maybe you want to learn how to get a stretch assignment or maybe you want to learn how to pivot from, uh, you know, this function to that function. There is someone giving you a playbook at no cost. So I, I really encourage a lot of people to think TikTok's just for dancing and all of that, but it's a lot more. Uh, so I, I, I say lean into the power because it's a way for people to share information at no cost. I, I agree. I'm new to TikTok because my brand company is pushing me on social. It's all, I agree with all those things. It's also really good now that White Lotus season two is completely over to be told about Easter eggs in the seats, in the individual, I haven't said it, I'm not gonna, I won't give anything away, but in the individual episodes, and we, my husband and I have been going back and watching and like, oh, we missed that. So it, it uh, TikTok is like a wealth of information for a variety of things. So sidebar, I just started watching White Lotus and I just finished season one. So I'm, I'm excited because that was like the past three days. I did, a, I, did a, I did a binge. And look See, at how we use that word differently. 10 years ago, you didn't say I was binging anything, but now we, we, I binge watch TV. <laughs> season two is better. Okay. Well, this has been a fun chat. I think we could easily talk for an hour. Each of you is so dynamic and has so much thought and perspective. Thank you for sharing your hearts and your expertise and your points of view on the future today with this audience and looking forward to having another one of these in the future. Uh, again, wishing each of you a very happy holiday season and a very happy 2023. And thank you to all of our listeners and viewers for your continued support. Welcome to each of you as our Rebels of the Heart alumni, and we're here to support each of you personally and in your lives professionally as well. So again, thank you, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.